Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Gretchen Giggin. I am the Data Services Coordinator for DPLA. Um, so that means that I am the one who works with you on ingesting your data and um, will work pretty closely during the um, initial phase, like for that first ingest. So what I wanted to talk to you about today was um, kind of how the harvesting process at DPLA works. So you get a sense of how it happens and kind of what to expect and how to get started, um, you know, with a little bit of before you do an application, but especially after you get that application in. So, um, uh-oh, next slide, there we go. So this is just a little look at kind of what DPLA um, looks like right now. So we have more than, um, actually, it's more than 14 million, I think we're above 14,450,000 records now. Um, we have 31 hubs that have currently have live, live data in DPLA. And we have, I think, about 10 or more than 10 that are currently in some form of um, the process of getting their data together and getting it ingested and live in DPLA. So those 31 institutions that are currently live represent more than 2,000 individual institutions. Um, and from those um, 31 hubs, we get at least nine different metadata um, schemas. And I will talk a little bit about what our, what our suggestions are about metadata schema. Um, and most of them um, provide records through OAI PMH, which um, gives us XML records. Um, but we do have some people who have an API available to us and are providing records directly in something like JSON. Um, but we do use primarily the standard metadata schemas, Dublin Core, Qualified, Dublin Core, Mods, Mark, um, things like that. I'll talk later about application profiles and how that can actually be pretty successful for you. So this is a look at the DPLA's metadata application profile. So this is a model of how we internally store data at DPLA. So um, it is a uh, kind of linked data um, data model. So instead of it being just kind of a schema, a, a flat record with a bunch of fields, um, we do model the records internally as a series of classes. So each class holds specific kind of information about um, about the original object, and then the classes have relationships to each other. So the primary part of it is called the ORE aggregation. And that's where we store the information about the identifier um, for the object, you, uh, you as a providing institution and a hub, and you know when the record was um, downloaded and, and all of that kind of administrative stuff that identifies the record and the object. Then the prim primarily the most of the um, descriptive metadata goes in a record called the source resource record. And that looks the most like your sort of traditional metadata record. And that's the one that we'll spend the most time working on when we work together. The other main part of it is called the web resource class. And that's where we store information about specific digital objects. So um, URLs to previews to thumbnails um, if you tell us like the type of um, image or uh, object it is. That's where that information goes. And then the source resource um, is further related to some other class for some of this contextual information like subjects, um, spatial locations, time periods. And the reason those are modeled in their own classes is because that allows us to hold um, more detailed information about a place, for example. So instead of just having you know one field that says Erie, Pennsylvania, where I live, um, we could have a whole separate record about Erie, Pennsylvania that could that we could point to from from the record, and that allows us to do some other kind of nifty like, data style things. But this is nothing to be um, like super concerned about. Um, towards the end of the presentation, I'll share with you links to documentation for the metadata application profile. Um, there's plenty of documentation out there. You can learn more about it if you'd like. Um, this is just to give you a sense of kind of how DPLA stores this data. So the big thing that we want to talk about today is the aggregation process um, and, and what that looks like. So this, this is kind of an overall high level um, diagram. Don't get too concerned. We'll, we'll go through it um, kind of piece by piece. Um, but it's an iterative process. There's three kind of major stages. Um, on this, <coughs> excuse me, on this flow chart, um, the steps that are in orange are steps that you guys are working on on your own. 
The steps that are blue are the steps that DPLA is working on on its own. And the steps that are in yellow are the, are the parts that we work on together, the reviews and the QA and things like that. Um, and then those green dots are our milestones um, for the process. Okay, excuse me. So the first step is what I call an initial analysis. And this um, happens before we even ingest any data. This happens when you have records in a feed or at an API that you're ready for me to look at. And I'll take a look at it and give you some feedback on how it's going to uh, work with the DPLA metadata application um, profile. I'll let you know if there are required elements I'm not finding or if there's any problem with data values. So I use a number of different tools um, ranging from just a simple web browser um, to look at your feed if it's an OAI feed as in this case. Um, I might download the records using some Python utilities. I might actually throw them into Google Refine and compare them in a spreadsheet view. That actually is really useful for quality control for checking um, if the you know required fields are there. So um, I use these different strategies. Um, and I share this stuff with you. Um, I can share with you spreadsheets. I can share with you reports and things like that so that we can work on um, how the data looks. So we usually start this process um, like after you've applied, um, but when you're probably like, let's say 75 to 90% finished with your data so that we still have some time to fix some things, um, but I'm looking at data that's pretty well shaped as to how you think you're gonna be able to provide it. The next step is then to just write a simple crosswalk. Um, it's just a, just in a spreadsheet um, so that we can agree on this. And so um, <clears throat> this will show us what um, records in your, uh, or what properties in your records we're gonna map to DPLA um, properties. And then we translate that actually into some code that uh, will run a script against your records and so we'll um, uh, run this script against the records that we'll harvest and create new DPLA map compliant records. Um, so DPLA will be completely responsible for translating the what's in this spreadsheet into this code. Um, and that of course will be an iterative process to make sure that we got everything right. So once we have all of that mapping ready to go, that's when we actually start the harvest process. So this will be the first time that we do a full scale harvest of your records. Um, as I said, usually it's an OAI harvest, but um, we can uh, work with you if you're interested in setting up some other kind of API. We've had, we have a number of different um, processes we've used and we can certainly give you recommendations on, on what's worked and what maybe hasn't worked so well. Um, <clears throat> After we harvest, um, we actually run that mapping. So I don't, I don't have a separate slide for that. So the harvesting and the running of the map of the records, um, all of that will happen our, on our end, um, and we'll iterate through it and get back to you once we've got map records that look pretty good. We also run some enrichments on records. So these are just kind of simple things that will um, kind of increase the consistency um, of your records to make them kind of match um, all of the rest of the records that DPLA has harvested. So a lot of these are pretty simple, you know, things like removing white spaces, um, removing HTML code that might have slipped in, um, uh, normalizing some punctuation. We have some more complicated enrichments that will actually normalize your date fields to the EDTF um, date format, which is um, you know, the simpler numerical um, uh, format of uh, year, month, day. Um, and that will be for internal purposes. So if your dates you know, are written in a more human legible format, that's still what it'll display. But we'll do things like normalizing the date, um, normalizing the languages to ISO codes, um, matching some of the place names to GeoNames URI. Um, we do those things in order to enable some, um, you know, kind of search and retrieval and um, browsing um, applications. But your original data that you create is still what's going to be visible to people, um, like through the DPLA website. 
once we um, do the enrichment of those records, that's when we're ready to bring you guys into the QA environment. Um, and we do have a uh, we have a QA interface that is kind of like a stripped down, um, uh, just you know, digital library kind of interface. So you can see here that um, we have facets um, and we have you know full uh, view of records, um, or at least a pretty substantial view of the metadata in this kind of search result. So you can go through and you can search um, for things. You can look at the facets to see, you know, did I get any stray um, place names or formats or, or creator names showing up that I didn't anticipate and which records did that affect. Um, instead of viewing individual records, we actually have an interface where you can view um, the new, newly created DPLA map record, the enriched record is there on the left, with your original record. So you can view um, records side by side for objects and um, that really helps to kind of track down did we maybe make some mistake in the mapping or did something get misinterpreted. We also have a number of reports um, that you can download and take a look at. And I should say, um, we'll both be doing QA, so I'll be using this alongside you um, and at the same time, and we'll both be looking for consistency issues um, that we maybe need to fix. Um, <clears throat> issues both in uh, you know mistakes uh, in the mapping, something we missed or misinterpreted, but also um, things that might ha be flaws in the original data that you might want to track down and, and um, and correct. So uh, we have reports that will show us like all of the values for particular properties. So you could download a report that would show you all of the format, unique values, all of the unique values for creator. Um, and it will also give you a link um, back to your original object. So that can be a good way for you to figure out where you want to um, you know, put some of your resources for um, fixing things. Um, we also have these validation reports, which are actually what's at the top of the screen. And those just tell us if required or highly recommended DPLA um, uh, properties are missing from records. So ideally, we don't want to see things show up in that area. Um, <coughs> In some cases, if they don't show up, um, it's okay. We would just let you know. We, we'd recommend this. In other cases, we really would need to track that down and fix that. So, for example, in this case, there were two records missing the data provider, which is the original institution name, and we would want you to, to correct those um, at your, as soon as possible. Um, so the, then the last step in the um, kind of ingest process is to take a look at those records in a test version of the website. So this looks exactly like the live, the live uh, website, but it's just a test version. And this helps us to find um, some kind of things that are more obvious with this more visual um, look. And it also allows us to see what the records look like in our timeline and our map, um, which are, are part of the website, but not part of the QA interface at the moment. Um, and then the last step is to just make that live data. So um, you can see here that it looks exactly the same. All that is going on in, in DPLA's end is that we're indexing it um, using a different um, instance of, of our, our indexing software called Elasticsearch. Um, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about then is data quality and what we're looking for in that, uh, in that quality assurance um, process. Because obviously, and I think this is um, something you probably know, but maybe you haven't articulated, but quality in metadata is highly contextual. It really has to do with what, um, what are the indicators of quality for a particular, um, for a particular um, uh, data set. So when we talk about aggregation, um, the context that we're talking about here, the things that are um, indicators of quality or, or that are indicators of what an aggregation is, the, the data is highly heterogeneous. So we're talking about data from all over, data from all different kinds of things. Um, so it can be hard to, um, to find common denominators. And that's why we really have to rely on, on pretty basic metadata. We can't do um, highly nuanced um, and format specific metadata. So we're mostly talking about you know, titles, creators, descriptions, and dates. Um, we're also in DPLA totally relying on the metadata. We are not currently using full text. Um, 
Um, so we don't want full text in the metadata. Full text is not going to be searched against. Um, so if you have very minimal records that rely on full text for searching, um, then you're probably going to need to evaluate how how those will um, how those will work with DPLA. You may need to spend some effort, um, you know, in, in enhancing that metadata or in pulling that metadata out of your feed initially. Um, and we're also relying on item level metadata um, for the most part. Now your items can be um, configured to, you know, an item could be describing an entire folder of objects, um, but we're not using things that are like nested um, descriptions like finding aids. Um, we're just not set up to be able to compare that kind of, you know, orange with the apple of an of a item level record for, for an object. Um, so those are really what the context is in DPLA that our quality um, has to be compared to. Um, so when we do that initial metadata analysis and when we do the, quali uh, the quality um, assurance process, we really look for um, two different kinds of issues, technical issues and content issues. And I'll say from DPLA's perspective, we have to we concentrate a lot more on the technical issues um, because we don't know as much about the content to be able to um, identify the content issues. And that's where you can really play a part in that QA process. Um, so the technical issues um, really have to do with the, the metadata um, being problematic for interoperability um, or uh, for implementation. So granularity, um, as I just discussed, um, can be an issue if you have, for example, um, a record for every page in a book and you know the record itself is uh, minimal, has no data really, other than maybe a page number, no descriptive data. Um, that's a granularity issue that does not mesh with the context of DPLA. We really need a single record for the entire book object, not a record for each page. Um, when I say inappropriate values, I don't mean um, like, you know, profanity. Um, I mean using the wrong metadata property for something. So using a date field for the digitization date um, is an inappropriate value in that field because by definition, um, what we're looking for is the date of the original creation. Um, lack of normalization um, uh, is uh, referring to a lack of consistency um, in the use of metadata and data values across data sets. So if you're at a hub and you're gathering data from 10 different institutions, um, you can't have um, 10 different um, ways that the date of creation has been encoded. So um, you wouldn't want to have one set using the field um, in Dublin Core date created and another one using just the word, just the field date and another one using, um, I don't know, date issued or something like that. That's what we're really talking about here is consistency in the metadata properties used. Um, that's just gonna make everything a lot easier to deal with if, if that is consistent. Um, we also um, uh, pay attention to noisy data. So in this case, in an aggregation context, that would be use of phrases like unknown or NA or dash dash or things like that. Um, we call that noise. It's really not very helpful in the aggregation context. And, and particularly, it's not helpful if um, it's inconsistent. Um, some using dash dash, some using unknown, some using NA, some leaving blank, that sort of thing. Um, and a lack of standard is, is obviously something that I think is a, a universal under, um, understanding. We all, we all know what we mean by that, but we, we do want you to use, say, Dublin Core um, according to its standard or mods according to its standard. Um, as far as the content um, issues, we will pay some attention to, you know, whether values seem meaningful, whether they're um, missing or confusing or incomplete. Um, but obviously, not knowing um, as much about the content, that stuff really only sticks out to me, in particular, if it's if it's really glaring. 
So um, just another way of looking at it, um, our, our data quality at DPLA is really kind of like a pyramid, and the first thing we really need to address are the technical problems at the bottom. That really needs to be the foundation in place so that um, so that then we can get to the point where we can say, um, is are these um, values meaningful? Are they representative? Um, we can't do that analysis until they're all there, for example. So um, that's also part of the reason why, why DPLA is concerning itself primarily with the technical kinds of issues with implementation of metadata. Um, so specific issues, like specific questions I would ask, um, what metadata schema is being used, um, if you're using OAI or using sets, um, it's not a requirement, it's just a, a thing to, to know for the future evaluation. Um, looking at the number of records, we do have a requirement that you start out as a service hub with at least 50,000 records, um, you know, just for judicious use of our resources. Um, as I mentioned, date um, is something that's often inconsistent across sets. Creator um, is often inconsistent. Publisher is actually often used inappropriately. People will use it to put in an institution, uh, like the institution that digitized the material, um, and we're really looking for the publisher of the original content. There's granularity issues, like I mentioned, um, about page level records and about full text. Um, those are the kinds of things I'm specifically going to be looking for. In terms of content, I'm specifically going to be looking for um, things that seem confusing. Um, those reports can help with that. Um, is geographic information um, being used consistently? Are you consistently referring to places in the same way, like city-state instead of state-city or something like that? Um, the, the kind of minimal requirements, does every record have a title, a right statement, a URL? Um, we highly encourage the use of the DCMI type vocabulary, um, so we'll be looking for that. Um, particularly the URL and the thumbnail, um, uh, the mapping for those can be confusing and inconsistent, so that's something I'll be looking for. And I'll also be looking to see that the content meets our, our kind of basic collecting guidelines, which is that um, we're looking for primarily you know, cultural heritage materials, we're not looking for institutional repository, um, you know, thesis and dissertation kind of materials. We're not, we're hoping not to get a lot of issue level newspapers unless there's significant descriptive metadata um, in the metadata records since we aren't, you know, gathering full text. Um, you know, we're not looking for finding aids, things like that. Um, we're looking for materials that have unrestricted access to content. So we don't want to click on a link and then um, be asked to sign in to, you know, some some community. Um, it should be something that's available to all. So here's just some examples um, to show you very specifically what I'm talking about. So in the first example, um, this provider was using DC Publisher to record both the name of the data provider and the original publisher. And so when all of those records get into the feed and the institution is in a DC Publisher field and the publisher is in a DC Publisher field, once we start mapping those records, we don't have a way to tell which one is which. Um, sometimes people will use the order of the elements and say, you know, the first one's always the institution and the second one's always the publisher, uh, but that becomes problematic when there are records that don't have um, two examples of that. Um, if you're using a, uh, a very uh, robust and uh, complicated standard like mods, um, you really need to pay attention to attributes. So in these two different examples here, they're both date created fields for the same date, but they have different attributes, which means when we try to write a scripting that will go through the records and map them, those two things look like different fields. And so um, uh, that, you know, creates a, a problem that our, that our scripting isn't prepared um, to, to handle those attributes. Um, let's see. Um, 
Another example we have, um, again, with mods, when there's multiple ways to say the same thing. So in mods, you could use mods geographic to record a, a place name, but you could also use mods hierarchical geographic with sub um, child elements for state, city, and country. So the, there isn't a right or wrong there. It isn't that mods geographic is right and hierarchical geographic is wrong. The problem just comes in when, say, one collection use mod, uses mods geographic and another collection uses hierarchical geographic. That's an example of that consistency issue. We want to see you using the same uh, field in all of the collections. Um, the next example has to do with conditional kinds of statements. Um, so we, we don't like to have to build up a mapping that says, you know, when the record appears in set A, use this write statement mapping, when records appear in set B, use this one. Um, so writes is just an example here, but um, the if, if we have to write all of these in, increasing kinds of conditional statements, if then else kinds of statements, we're just really increasing the likelihood that we're gonna make errors and making that quality control um, process really difficult. Um, and finally, we also try to discourage um, mappings that require uh, mappings that require us to um, look for a string value. So look for the DC identifier that starts with HTTP colon slash slash. Um, that is possible, but it just makes for a very complex and very error prone process. So we, we try to avoid that. It's much better if you can say the URL is always in the DC identifier or the URL is always in EDM is shown at and we don't have to actually evaluate what's in the property. Um, so um, as far as recommendations, we have um, historically tried to um, shy away from very firm recommendations. We really, we want it, we want you to succeed. Um, we are willing to be flexible and work with you. But we have found that, it, that if you were to implement an application profile using elements from the Dublin Core, Dublin Core terms, or DC and qualified DC, and the Europeana data model, um, that has been a very successful situation. Um, basically, what you would be doing is creating your own application profile that essentially um, mirrors the DPLA map. And that way we have just a very straightforward mapping. Your DC title maps to our DC title. Your EDM is shown at maps to our EDM is shown at. Um, so application profiles are actually not very difficult to set up. Um, we can provide you with some help um, if, if you need it. Um, if you're using an OAI feed, it's been pretty successful. Um, if you can't set up an application profile, if that's a limitation that you have, have we have had the most success with Qualified Dublin Core, um, with a close second being MODS. MODS is very robust and is very capable of handling a lot of these situations. Um, it just presents and said, a larger barrier for you in terms of consistency because as was shown on the last slide, MODS gives you a lot of different ways of saying the same thing. So you need to spend some extra time making sure that everybody is saying the same thing the same way, for example. Um, at this time, I really do not recommend using simple Dublin Core. Um, it is just not robust enough for expressing um, some of the requirements um, for DPLA metadata. So there's not a good place to put um, that URL that links back to your records. There's not a good place to put your name as the hub or your name as the contributing institution. Um, so we can make it work, but it, it, it is a little bit um, difficult to make it work. Um, so here's, as I mentioned, some helpful documents. Um, I'm happy to leave this slide up as long as, um, as long as necessary, and I can follow up with you all with an email um, with these specific links. Um, that is my email address and my name, Gretchen Giggin, just FYI, I know it's hard. Um, I'll go back to this slide and say that's um, what I have for um, my little run through and I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you might have at this time or talk about any of this in some more depth. 
people have questions. So it occurs to me that um, that a service hub would have to have some sort of coordinating committee that would get all of this figured out before anything starts. Is that right? So did you hear that, Gretchen? Um, a little bit. Maybe you could repeat it. So she said it occurs to her that um, a service hub would need to have some sort of coordinating committee to get this figured out before they start bringing in data. That's how a lot of them do it. Um, they have like a metadata committee that uh, reviews and sets up some guidelines. I would say um, it's good before your application to maybe think about the basics of how you would do it, and then um, we can talk about you know the specific um, metadata elements you would want to you know specifically use. But yeah, you need to take a look at all of the data standards used by all of the. Um, uh, providers you're going to be um, uh, bringing in and you're basically going to have to figure out how to map them to the same schema. Um, so basically you're all doing what I do on a, like a smaller scale for just your hub. Other questions? Go ahead. So if you have uh, content that has less than simple Dublin for Simple Dublin Core. Um, do those need to be upgraded to qualify Dublin Core? And, and then with also a check of the semantic use of the metadata fields. Did you hear that? Um, basically, I think it sounded like uh, you're asking if you have uh, some of your partners are using Simple Dublin Core. Do you need to like upgrade their records? Is that basically what? The basically, or even less, you know, that just have a few fields. So what will happen basically? I'll tell you what um, most of our partners do is they uh, use XSLT, and basically what they'll do is say the the source record is Dublin Core, and they've implemented an application profile. So what their XSLT will do is it will map what's available in their record into qualified Dublin Core fields, and then it will supply, for example, um, the name of the organization, which is one of the fields that um, that uh, you know we would require and wouldn't necessarily be in the source. So basically, through a combination of SSLT um, mapping and um, a little bit of enhancement, they'll, they'll add that information. I will say the requirements that we have um, for participation, um, like the requirements that we have for records are pretty minimal. I mean, really, if it has a title and a right statement and the proper attribution and URLs, um, that's okay. We certainly recommend that you get as much descriptive metadata in there as you can. Um, so the only real, as far as actual like descriptive metadata elements, um, the only real problem with Dublin Core, simple Dublin Core, is that it lumps temporal information and spatial information into one field. Um, but for the other, for the other parts, title, subject, um, creator, contributor, all of that is fine. So I mean, basically, what you do is you would. I guess essentially um, map your simple Dublin Core records into new, say, qualified Dublin Core records, um, and they, you know, might be missing um, some fields, but you would uh, just need to supply the additional required ones, which are basically administrative. Anyway, does that does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Um, so we have a, a bit of a double act. We have a, Gretchen, would you say I'm right at this? We have a number of hubs that um, some providers or even some collections are simple Dublin Core, and then over time, uh, people have in, improved their metadata, they've changed schema or what have you and so like I showed you the North Carolina slide earlier where they had Dublin Core coming from one provider qualified Dublin Core coming from different provider and they're mapping that all the mods so like I said you know it might not be very rich mods because the original source is basic Dublin Core for some of the data but some of the people are actually providing richer data so the people that are providing the richer data the more rich the mods the people that are just providing Dublin Core, that mods is not very rich, but it is what it is. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, as long as everything in your feed that you're sending to us is using the same schema, that's really what we're concerned about. We can't tell you, you know, that your source institution has to use that schema. Um, you know, they they can have they can maintain their data in whatever standard they want, but you'll want your feed to have everybody consistently using the same schema. And some of those records will be better than others, and that's just the way that the world is. <laughs> Other questions for Gretchen? Tech, metadata people, any any questions? Good. All right. Well, Gretchen, thanks. Sure. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Um, you can feel free to um, you know share my email, and um, I can send. Uh, I'll, I'll work with Kelsey. I can get you guys some of these links after the fact if you want them. Yep. We'll make sure and share all the slides and everything. Sounds great. Thanks, Gretchen. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Talk to you later. All right. Um, we want to take a five-minute bathroom break, ten-minute bathroom break, coffee, more cookies. If people need more cookies, <laughs> why not, right? A little bit backwards, but we'll start at the top on how they're I mean, <laughs> the organizing the hub. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about the South Carolina model, where um, it was kind of broken into region. Uh, certainly, with WVU being the larger institution at the top of the state and Marshall being the larger institution at the bottom of the state with the Library Commission kind of in the middle or facilitated for the public library voices. Um, uh, but we still didn't know exactly how we would take the leadership roles in that. Um, and it kind of depends on if that's the model chosen, you know, to provide a voice from each of the institutions and then maybe a rotating position of leadership through uh, some of the public libraries or the other cultural heritage institutions in the state to kind of build some kind of little consortium that we can communicate together. Um, we did have some institutions that uh, should be involved that aren't here today, some I didn't even know about, um, like the National Park Service up in Shepherd, um, which is a federal institution, um, as well as many of the other state uh, libraries who might be small, but they might have institutional records that could facilitate. Um, Kinsley, Bethany, Shepherd, Western State, Bluefield State, um, Concord, um, as well as some of the, uh, uh, there's a public library, um, is the Ohio State Public Library? They're not Ohio State, but they're Ohio County. 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 Public Library that have already, and I've heard in, through the grapevine, they're already interested in something similar to this and might have contacted about the Ohio hubs mm -hmm. yeah. or that area. They're so, moving. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's definitely um, a conversation that's happened in some of the other public libraries that are larger. Um, but of course, they're not here today. Yeah. Um, we did have some classifications for our institutions in our group. Um, WVU, most likely an A. West Virginia Wesleyan, probably B, A. Uh, B. Uh, Marshall, B minus until I found out past perfect could possibly work, and then we might move up to a full B. Um, but certainly the public libraries, a C, or maybe not even on the map yet because they haven't digitized. D. Yeah, of course. A C minus, we don't like Ds in here. But um, the, just the idea that some of them have maybe digitized some small things um, and, and or haven't digitized at all, but then are great to start from scratch, right? Once we set a framework, then it makes it easier. Um, and then challenges, um, not going to lie, I talked about money. If we go to a model where we have to pay, um, you know, I don't know how that would break down amongst the institutions and, and how we would do that um, fairly, um, as well as um, certainly just the geographical breadth of our state, but not as many large institutions like North Carolina had a whole right. bunch. We don't have as many. Yeah. Um, so that might be a challenge. Could be a bonus in that we you know, we get starts from scratch with some of them so we don't have any like... We won't have the issues things. because we've already got the standardization Station, practice yeah. from all the A groups, so we know what we're doing. We'll just yeah. start zipping them out. And, then, I and guess, then there's also a, a, a survey that was done yes. five or six years ago that the, we have access to yeah. that it's all of the cultural heritage organizations in the state, so uh, like the Huntington Museum of Art, Art and I mean, some of the other, of other museums throughout. Sure, that's good. And so was that like connecting to collections yes. kind of yes. thing? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay, cool. Um, um, 
Did I hear someone in your group mention the state archives? Yes. Yes. Okay. Which and they have uh, existing digital collections or oh yeah, oh, yes. 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 Steam have... stuff, but they're the ones that have it on the website and in Excel spreadsheets only. I do not think they have any. No content management no. system. No. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. So they're definitely a D minus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but they have tons of content. They've got lots of content. <laughs> tons they're of great content. stuff. It's okay. just nobody can get to it. Tons oh. of content. Okay. All right. Anything else, guys? I think we should oh. invite Joe to come. We yes. should. Yeah, yeah, Joe. And we talked about for our next steps of be as a group continue thinking about what we're doing, and then at the next WVLA or get together in a couple of months to sit down and really start hashing out these brainstorm ideas so we know how we're going to move forward. Form like some working groups or yeah, something absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Get some committees together. Can we also talk about standardization? Yes. yes, we did, talking about getting a committee to talk about what standards we're going to use, what schema, and other things. And training. And training. And training. And training. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we also talked about thinking about some of the smaller libraries um, not having a place to put their stuff. Mm -hmm. They're willing to digitize, um, but they don't have anywhere to put it. Yeah. 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 And so if, even if we chose a, a model where we connect back to those collections and not choose a central repository, we're probably still going to have to find some kind of ad hoc, either at the State Library Commission or with some open source material to allow those small institutions to have a place to deposit their material. Mm -hmm. What do people run repository-wise? We haven't even talked about that today. What does West Virginia run <laughs> for repository? We have Hydra and Fedora. You do? Have, and That's perfect. You really run Fast Forever? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's what we got. Other things? Content DM. You run Content DM. That's, that's it? Okay. What kind of license is your Content DM? Hosted. But is it like yeah. unlimited or like a... No, we're no. up to that. I think we're up to the second level. Yeah. All right. That's what a lot of people do for a shared repository situation okay. is buy an unlimited license content DM and then people go together and put their stuff in that unlimited license content DM. So that's what we see in a lot of states for the smaller institutions to participate. I would not be ups upset if I didn't have to pay that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was just throwing that out. That would be fine with me. Yeah, yeah I can just throw that out. All right. Well, and DPLA has also been involved in a project called Hydra in a Box yeah. that yeah. some people may okay. have heard of. Yes. and. Um, there may potentially be a hosted model hosted for Hydra. that could that could also to be a hosted Hydra Fedora yeah. system. Absolutely. All right. This group. So I was the note taker, so I see what I can <laughs> decipher from these notes. My sense of hearing the report from your group is that we have a lot of parallel thinking going on here, but we weren't listening in over there. <laughs> 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 We, had, we came up with these thoughts on our own. Um, we were concerned about the um, archives not being represented today. We we're quite certain that they were invited. We just didn't have an RSVP back. So we need to cultivate that and continue to organize it. Um, we came up with the same points about setting clear standards and, and encouraging smaller places to begin digitizing with guidelines if they haven't already. But then uh, John came up with the fact that we might be able to partner with the state of Virginia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She needs to break down the coffee. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so she's waiting for oh. oh. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Leave, leave the cookies. Especially because you're wearing a Starfleet Academy sweatshirt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than Star Trek. It is a Star Trek. It is a theme. It's the best. It's the best. It's the best. It's the best. That's so, the second Star, Star Trek reference that we've had today. So. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. No, one time that someone um, asked me, I was wearing this hoodie, and she was like, oh, are you going to go into NASA? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, well, she was, I was working a uh, tailgate uh, for a WP game, and she's like, oh, well, if you don't go to school here, why do you have, like, why are you working here? And I'm like, I do go to school here. And she's like, oh, are you just going to go into NASA afterwards? And I'm like, no, it's from Star Trek. <laughs> She was like, oh, the one with the swords? <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's awesome. This is what I miss about not being on the college campus. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, back to the yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> one interesting avenue that we may have is a cooperative partnership with the state of Virginia, um, where John Hill has 
took the equipment and traveled around. Cleveland public. So yeah, there's a lot of people that are actually kind of doing that, but yeah, I, I joked and called it Scanabago, but I could never get Winnebago to give me that. <laughs> anyway. Nice try. Thanks. And the final thought was that we need a manual. Mm. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think you guys did great today. Um, lots of good thoughts and lots of similar thoughts between the two groups, which I think is awesome. Um, and you didn't even cheat and talk to each other. So that's a good thing. <laughs> we were so, too busy talking internally. That's right. That's right. That's good. So I think, um, obviously, it sounds like maybe next steps is maybe to form some sort of working committees, working groups to like explore. Maybe like you have a task force on metadata and maybe on aggregation or something like that and maybe outreach. Um, thinking about what your what your groups might need to do um, and then kind of when they might need to meet so um, I'm assuming that there is probably an existing email list yes of, of folks who were invited um, and you know that you guys could follow up via email and then you know physically meet and kind of form some working groups but honestly it's a logical step that's what a lot of people do um, kind of coming out of these kinds of meetings. Some people already have them formed by the time we get here. Um, some people don't. So um, it's a logical first step. This uh, Florida just submitted an application um, like a month ago, two months ago, and I started with them over a year ago. And they had not formed any working groups. And so from a year from the time I met with them, they were able to submit an application. So um, they kind of came out of a meeting like this, formed working groups, and just moved towards the process. Um, so I think that um, something like that, giving yourself a reasonable timeline, um, you are a smaller state, which is nice. Um, so with not necessarily a huge amount of partners, so maybe that will allow you some flexibility um, in, in, in movement. But if there's anything that we can do to help you, 
to answer questions that you have that come up along the way, please reach out um, to us. We'll be happy to do that. Um, and Kelsey can coordinate those questions for you. So she, her email is just kelsey at dp.la. So um, look it up. It's an unusual spelling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, By my parents. <laughs> How do you spell it? It's K-E-L-C-Y. It is. It's mostly S E Y. It's S E Y. My name is also spelled like Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and that last name never gets spelled right either. Yeah. So there's always an extra P's in there, or an, or an A, yeah. and or the H. Yeah, yeah. 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 something about the H. Yeah. So. All right. So I think are we good? Everybody can be dismissed, yeah. and um, and then good luck. And you'll take me upstairs, but good luck to everybody and do yeah, give do us a be shout in touch. with any questions. Yeah, do be definitely. In touch. We're happy to help you along yeah. the process. And also, um, so DPLA Fest, in case I don't know if people are on the info oh, yeah. list for DPLA, but um, every year we have a meeting called DPLA Fest. It's going to be April 20th and 21st in Chicago this coming year, so that can also be a way to kind of stay linked in with what's going on. Meet that's other really hubs, great. talk to other Meet hubs. other hubs and talk to other hubs. I think that's the other thing, too, is if, um, if there are other people you like what they're doing or you just want to ask them or if there's technology that you're interested in in particular, if other people run it or you want to know, like, hey, what does so-and-so do? We'd like to know. What's Pennsylvania do? You know, we want to talk to them. Um, Pennsylvania is one of those people who actually run a hydra, uh, and they built their own hydra aggregator. So there, there are things like if you're interested in, we can put you in contact with those people. And what I hear from the other hubs who are forming is that those conversations are almost the most valuable. So um, they're the ones on the ground doing the work. Yeah. 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 Exactly. All right. Awesome. Nice to meet you all. Thank you all so much.